Good morning. morning. It's still a good morning. Yes, it's still a good morning. Um, We actually have quite a few things to cover today. So we're going to kind of, it's going to be a little bit more disjointed than we normally are. But I'm kind of a disjointed person anyway, so you guys should just be able to go right along with it, right? Right. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Dustin. I'll pay you afterwards. A um, couple things that I want to address. First, right off the bat, um, <clears throat> for any of you that are paying attention to the news, to um, Facebook, Twitter, uh, there, there's been a couple things that have come up in the last couple weeks regarding the church. Um, you know, the Marcel Church, um, the Osteens. Um, I have one thing that I want to say about this, okay? Um, Paul writes in the in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 6. Um, he's talking about lawsuits among believers, and, and that's not the issue that I want to address. But he has one statement in there that I want to read to you. Let me, let me turn over there real quick. Um, oops. First Corinthians, uh, it is chapter 6, verse 4. Paul is writing and he says, So if you have such cases, when he's talking about lawsuits, he says, Why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. And I want to share with you, um, we have a responsibility to the body of Christ to not bring mockery or shame on the body of Christ. Now, what happened with Mark Driscoll and what happened with Victoria Osteen, that's church business. Okay, Whatever correction needs to be done is done in the church. And quite honestly, after looking at Facebook, I was so disgusted yesterday with the number of Christians that are broadcasting the church's issues for all the world to see, I'm ashamed. Look, whether you agree with what was said or done in Mars Hill's church or in the Osteen's church, you know, that, that's not the issue that I'm addressing today. What I'm addressing today is why in the world would we take the church's garbage and flaunt it for the world to see. The world that has no understanding of what the body of Christ is supposed to be about, and we run it out there for them to judge. Now, everybody's got opinions. My grandfather had a saying. Opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got them, and they all stink. Okay? We need to understand that there is a line that we should not be crossing. When we get onto um, media, social media, and we start airing our grievances against the body of Christ before a world that does not know Christ, that's shameful. That is shameful. We're holding the body of Christ up to ridicule. And that's, that's abhorrent. What has he done that the world would mock him? If we're the only representatives that they're ever going to see of Christ, we've got to do a better job. Now, I'm not saying that in each of these situations it should not be addressed. Absolutely, they should be addressed. Without a doubt, they should be addressed but within the church, not without. Okay? We deal with it within the church, not without. So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, I've heard about da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Look, if they're not a Christian, you have no basis for commonality to discuss the issue. The extent of your conversation should be, 
yeah, that, their church is dealing with that. Their church should take care of that. All right? If they are a Christian, your response should be, yeah, the church should take care of that. <clears throat> Anything beyond that, you're setting yourself up for a dangerous position. Yeah, there, there, there's error. Quite honestly, there's error all throughout this room. You know what? If you are without error, put your hand up. Because right then, you'll be in error. So go ahead. <laughs> nice save, Kevin. <laughs> So I just, I just wanted to lay before you, be so very cautious. Examine everything. Before you move on anything, examine it. Hold it out into the light of God's word. See if there's truth in it. Once you've determined whether there's truth or falsity, then move forward again cautiously. You know, if there is discipline that needs to be done, fantastic. Do so. We discipline with what hope? That they might be restored. We don't discipline to kick them down. Discipline is always for the purpose of edification to build back up, okay? So be cautious in how you represent Christ to an unsaved world. Amen? Amen. Okay. I'll get off of that soapbox. Well, that's pretty much the only soapbox I had today. Um, I have asked... Um, there you are. You're supposed to sit over here. You guys can't do that to me. I'm going to have to have you guys have signs and just hold them above your head so I know where you are. Uh, I have asked Laura if she would be willing to come up today and share her testimony with us. And this is significant today for two reasons. One, well, three reasons. One, because it's always significant. Anytime you share your testimony, it's significant. So, two, well, because... Today, Travis is actually here with us after having been gone for most of the summer and getting ready to be gone most of the rest of the year. We actually have Travis back with us. Welcome home, Travis. <laughs> because we understand, you know, when you got to work, you got to work and you go where the work is. So we understand, you know, when, when uh, you have to leave town, but boy, we sure appreciate it when you're back. So, and three, because today, Laura is getting baptized. So... We are going to turn this over to you and let you come and share what God has laid on your heart. Ready, go. I'm pretty lucky. I got asked a week ago, not 10 minutes ago, like some of you, so thank you for that. Be ready um, in season and out. I know, that's right. You never know. Um, so I have always known about God. I think I learned about the same time I learned about Pinochle, because I've always just known how to play Pinochle and I've known about God, <laughs> just always. And I credit that to my grandparents. I lived really close to both sets. And every holiday, every family gathering, I had both sets of grandparents around, very strong in their faith, went to church every Sunday. Forgive me, Grandma in jeans. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I went to Sunday school every Sunday. I went to youth group, um, mostly for the boys. Doesn't everyone go to youth group for the socializing? Yes, <laughs> we all did. That's where I heard about my husband. I actually knew his brother um, all through youth group, but he never went the same times I went. And there was just this mysterious Travis Jones that, oh, you've got to meet him, you've got to meet him. And when I was 17, I did. And... God gave me my soulmate when I was 17 years old, and thank goodness he gave me the knowledge and wisdom not to get married until I was quite a bit older, but um, went to college at Boise State, and that's where you know everything about God. You have all the philosophical conversations with your friends, spirituality conversations, you just know everything there is to know. Well, I found out that I didn't because knowing about God is significantly different than knowing God. And I was with a really good friend of mine. He's one of my best friends to this day. And we both had insomnia really bad. And we're, you know, out with all our friends. And everybody leaves except the two of us. And we're having one of our philosophical conversations. And he says, so who's, who's Jesus? And I was like, oh, I know who this is. I know the question. I know the answer. So Jesus is my savior. And he goes, uh-huh. So who's Jesus? And I was like, uh, son of God? He's like, no, who's Jesus? And by this time, I'm going to get a little frustrated because, of course, I know who Jesus is. I mean, don't all Christians know who Jesus is? And this friend of mine, to describe him a little bit, very, like, down like this, kind of droopy, 
kind of mumbled a little bit. Um, you had a really hard time understanding him. And he sits straight up, eyes just bright and clear, and says, I'm here to help you find your way. And I was like, <gasps> and then he just kind of slumped down again. And I was like, what did you say? He's like, what? I just asked you who, who Jesus was. And right then, I was given the privilege and honor of being spoken to by my Savior. And I know it's because Jesus will meet you where you are. He will go, oh, hey, she needs a person that says, I'm here, hello. Some, it might be a car accident where a light happens and your life, your life flashes before you and he, and he says, it's okay, you'll be fine. You know, for others, it's a walk in the park. It's a, you know, you're on top of a mountainside watching a sunrise or a sunset. But I think for me, the point is just being open to those moments and seeing what God and Jesus has to offer to all of us and being open for God to speak through you, which I'm so grateful my friend was. I mean, if it wasn't for that moment, I wouldn't realize that it's the relationship with God and Christ that is the most important thing. And after that moment, I mean, I was hungry. What church can I go to? What Bible studies can I get into? Um, I went to Calvary Chapel in Boise. Um, they have awesome, like, college-level courses because I had been in college, so that's, I mean, I wanted to continue learning and um, was had an amazing career, and I applied for this job that I really wanted really, really, really bad. And I knew it was God's will. I'm just sure it's God's will. And it came down to my friend and I, and I didn't get the job. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? I've already been doing this job. How did I not get this job? Well, of course, God has other plans for us. And that same position opened up here in Montana. And I applied, and we both got promoted, and we moved to here. I was like, if you would have told me in high school I'd be living in Montana, I'd be like, I don't even know where that is, so why would I be here? <laughs> and it's freezing cold there too, so no, I'm thinking Hawaii or Vegas or something warm. No, no, here I am. And I, with this job, I traveled all the time. And, you know, I had a relationship with God. So on every plane ride I went on, I was with God. Every, you know, new restaurant I tried, God was with me. Every coworker I spoke with, God was with me. But it got to the point where... I wasn't in fellowship with fellow Christians. I wasn't serving how I was supposed to be serving and doing what I was called to do. And I decided I needed to find a church and God helped me with that because I got laid off from my job. So now I had all this time to find Bible studies and churches. And um, I um, went to a friend's wedding and she's a pastor's daughter and she lived in Louisiana and was moving here. And I was like, oh, pastor's daughter, surely she's found a church in Montana. So she said, yes, I have, and it's in Missoula. I was like, okay, I'm not driving five days a week to Missoula because I don't have a job now, so I'm going to go check it out. And I went to the women's Bible study, and that's where I met Sherry Cabrera. So most of you know the famous Sherry. If you don't, please meet her. She's amazing. And she says, at that Bible study, when we talk about how we all came to that place, she says, well, I went to this amazing church in Stevensville for years and years, and now I'm here. And I was like, Stevensville, because I live in this area, didn't think to look locally. I'm thinking, you know, big cities have to have the churches that I'm looking for. And I was like, why did she go there for so long? What was so great about it? And ooh, why isn't she going there now? And so I did have the opportunity to talk with her and just raved about Jesus Community Church. On and on and on this girl went about you guys. Every compliment you could possibly imagine. And she said the only reason she's not there is her family really should sleep where they're living. Work was in Missoula, school was in Missoula, so that's the only reason she left, and I really should try it out. So I come that next Sunday, and I'm sitting, I probably should be in my spot, because I was right there, and Chrissy, the sweet, sweet pastor's wife, comes over to me and says, are you Laura? And I was like, how do you know my name? I, what? <laughs> and that's just a testament to this group of people. All of you have blessed me in ways I cannot even describe. From that very moment on, I knew I was home. And here I am today, and I just am so grateful that you all give me the opportunity to share my time with you, share our lives with you, and we just, my sweetheart and I, wish you so many blessings, and we can't wait to get to know you further and find out what other amazing things God has for us. So, thank you. Appreciate it. So do I. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. 
By the way, if you didn't know Sherry, she's like Laura. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, sometimes I catch you out of the corner of my eye and I hear you say something, and I look expecting Sherry. Yeah, neither of us are shy. No. <laughs> no. Okay, so we are still working through the essentials, and this week I was actually going to begin the end, but we're not going to get there yet. The end is still to come. And you know that because you woke up this morning. So, um, while I was praying, actually, while I was doing the message last week, I, I kind of felt God prompting me that I needed to kind of take last week's message a little bit further. Okay? And last week we, were, uh, we talked about the nature and condition of man. A couple weeks ago we talked about the problem and original sin, the curse, and we, we kind of left it with, um, you know, we're stuck. Tune in next week, and you'll see the solution. And, and last week, we covered redemption. And while I was praying this week, and, and I'm, you know, working on my notes for the end, um, I just really felt like God was kind of steering me back. And so uh, throughout the course of the week, and, and I, I don't do my lessons like a lot of pastors. A lot of pastors will, will set down blocks of time. And they'll say, you know, oh, I, I can't do anything on Monday because that's the day I work on my message or, you know, Wednesday afternoons. I, I don't do that. I, I just have in my quiet time and in my prayer times and as God leads, I just, I make notes. And I, I just jot down notes and thoughts and ideas and as God leads. And then um, usually about Thursday, I start kind of pulling all of them together. And then on Saturday, I go, okay, God, how do you want me to present this? And so yesterday... Um, I was I was going through my list and and have my notes and um, how many of you did the home <clears throat> did the homework? Okay, come on, you don't be shy. Put your hands up. Okay, see. I, how many of you didn't do the homework? <laughs> You're excused because you weren't here last week to get it. You're excused too. You guys are not excused. <laughs> Okay, what was the homework? Your excuse? You can't excuse yourself. It doesn't work that way. I tried that all throughout my school career, and they never accepted it. Your dog ate it. Your dog ate Isaiah 53. That's a very discerning dog. Last week I asked you guys if you would read Isaiah 53 in light of God's plan of redemption. Okay? So, go ahead and flip over to Isaiah 53. I'm just going to read a couple of verses out of here that I want to key in on. Okay? And then we're going to move forward. So, Isaiah 53. I'm going to pick up in verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 4. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I'm going to reread this, and I'm going to put emphasis on certain things, okay? So I just kind of read through it right there, and now I'm going to reread it with certain emphases, okay? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced. For our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Amen. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. Okay? Now we're going to jump down a couple verses. I'm going to pick up in verse 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall a righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Okay. Now I just want to go through and I want to clarify some terms. Just so we're all understanding when we just read these verses and it was talking about he and him. That's Jesus. Okay. When he's talking about us and our and we, that's us. Okay? So if you kind of go through and look back over this again, you'll see that he is righteous. We are not. He was punished so that we would not. He was afflicted so that we would not. And I, I love this passage because it says, He shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. How, what? what? You're just talking about the suffering, the affliction, the persecution, the death. And yet, he's talking about prospering him. And he shall see his offspring. Who are his offspring? Us. We're going to get to that. Simple answer, us. <coughs> well, kind of. Kind of. Now, I'm going to, I want to just to kind of touch on that in relation to homework. Now, if you would flip over with me to Galatians, please. Chapter uh, 1. Galatians chapter 1. Well, you know what? I'm going to back up a little bit because a lot of you guys are, I feel like you're behind me. I'm going to back up here. And that's really going to throw me off because I'm not used to being this far behind. So Galatians chapter 1. Now I find this interesting because Paul goes through his um, typical courtesy, his introduction. He says, uh, Paul an apostle, not of men or through men, but through Jesus Christ. He's talking about to the churches. He's talking about grace and peace to you. He's doing what we would do at the beginning of our letter. Hello. He is exchanging the pleasantries. Not that they're not heartfelt. But that he is, he is doing what is customary at the time. Okay. But if you jump down here to verse 6. Well, actually, let's look at verse 5. He says, Amen. It's almost like Paul is going through, and I'm just going to read this. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. All right? And now it's like he takes a deep breath. Here it comes. He's unloading. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel... Contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. 
As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. He just unloaded on the churches of Galatia. Okay? You can't help but feel his frustration at what's going on here. Okay? I mean, he's like, hey guys, I'm, I'm wishing God's blessings on you, peace and grace to you. What is going on? What happened? Where are you? And while I was praying, even while I was given the message last week, I felt like God was kind of prompting me. You know, he, he makes it very clear. He says, um, you are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. Look, there is one gospel. You can neither add to nor take away from it and make it the gospel. If you add to it or take away from it, it's no longer the gospel. And then he says, not that there is another one. There is no other one. There's one. And he says, um, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, I have to share with you, we spent some time last week talking about redemption. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in the bulletin last week, I gave you the common man's guide to Christian ease. Because in the church, we use a lot of words that, you know, you hear um, things like, Jesus was a vicarious propitiation for our sins. Say what now? I don't get that. Or, or in churches, I, I know none of you guys grew up in the type of churches that I did, but the big thing in the church that I grew up was, I'm, I'm sanctified! Could you do that somewhere else, please? <laughs> What's sanctified? What does that mean? So I, I just I wrote up a simple thing last week. That I think there are still some copies over on the table over there if you want it. Um, basically, when I use terms, I want you to understand what I mean. Okay? So I printed this up, and, and we went over it last week. <clears throat> but we were dealing with redemption because I love the term redeemed. Okay? Because the term redeemed refers to a slave state. Okay? You, you were a slave. And God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, okay, the incarnation, and he redeemed us. He paid a price that we would be set free. Okay? So we were slaves, and he came and paid the price and bought us out of slavery. Okay? To which our natural reaction should be willingly submitting ourselves as bond servants unto him. Right? See, the thing is, you're never not a slave. You get that? You're always a slave. Always. And, and when you go, oh, no, no, I got control of my life, boy, are you deceived. Boy, are you deceived. The enemy hears that, and he just loves it. Satan loves to hear people say, Oh, I got control of my life. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. Okay? Because he is the deceiver, right? All right? He wants us to believe that we can do something of our own ability to merit anything before God, to merit anything in eternity. And we see that in the church. And this is the gospel that is not a gospel I want to share with you today. Okay? The gospel that is not a gospel. All right? Um, last week, we, we went through John 3, 16, um, 16, 17, 18. We covered um, a little bit in Hebrews. We talked about, I'm going to turn there right now, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I love this because this is the gospel wrapped up all in one spot. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to move forward, okay? So 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 17. Okay? Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, you understand the phrasing there? That's very particular. God reconciled us to himself. That means he was the offended party, and it should have been our obligation to rectify the offense, but we could not do that, so he made a way that we could be reconciled to him. Okay? Oh, yeah, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Hmm. We'll talk about that later. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Hmm, boy, that keeps coming up, doesn't it? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about this morning, the black eye we give God because of how poorly we represent him. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now here it is, right here, one verse that covers the sum total of salvation, redemption. Okay. For our sake, he, being God, made him, being Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Okay? So this is the first part of salvation right here. God made him to be sin that was perfectly holy, <coughs> sanctified. He had no sin in him. He made him to be sin, but he doesn't end there. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay? So see, the condition, we're slaves to sin. We have no hope, no ability of our own to reconcile ourselves to God. God knew that. God reached down, created the incarnation, Christ, who is fully God and fully man, who led a perfect sinless life, being subject to every temptation that you and I or anyone ever has or ever will be tempted with, and yet did not sin. Now think about how big that is, okay? Because remember, sin isn't just the action. Sin is what is birthed in the heart. So even in his heart, Jesus did not sin. And then he allowed him to be the perfect sacrifice once and for all, no further sacrifice is needed. It's done. It is accomplished. When Jesus was on the, Christ, the cross, he said, it is finished. It is actually a term used in trading. It's what they would stamp. We actually have hundreds of these um, negotiated agreements in transactions that are stamped with this phrase. And it means paid in full. Nothing is owing. It's finished. Okay? Not mostly, not everything except the interest. It means everything. Okay? So there lies salvation, but it doesn't end there because he's not just taking something away from us. He's putting something into us. He is making us something other than what we were. That's why the old is gone and the new has come. Okay? What is he giving us? Righteousness. Well, great, fantastic, far out. What's that mean? Well, think about that for a minute. What does righteousness mean? I mean, righteous, you know, we have this idea that righteous is, okay, we're made right. Okay, great. But it's not just your standard everyday righteous. Like, like um, you know, uh, Eric and I have a problem. I've done something to offend Eric. I broke his fishing rod. I put a hole in his tube that he was going to go float, but it doesn't matter now because I broke his fishing rod as well. Does he have a right to be offended? No, he doesn't read the scriptures. Come on. No, he does. He does. But as a brother in Christ, he would know better than to be offended. So we're good, right? Good, because we've got to talk after church. But if I were to go to Eric and say, look, I messed up. I, I was trying to do your 
fishing thing and it went backwards and it caught your tubey thing and when it went forward your tubey thing went flat and that snapped. <laughs> How are you doing today, Eric? <laughs> but if I were to go and say, look, I, I blew it, I messed up, so here, I'm going to give you a better, a better tube, a, a better fishing rod, I want to make it right. Okay. Now, he might still be hurt because that was his favorite tube. He's had that since he was four. <laughs> you know, that's his favorite fishing rod. He got it at Walmart. He caught his first fish with it. But, but I would have made things right between us, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're not getting a new fishing rod. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's not even it. Because, see, he still knows the offense that I did, right? Even though I have made reparation, he still knows the offense, correct? See, that's not what the righteousness of God is. See, the righteousness of God is never having known sin. When God removes our sin, it's done. It's gone. It's as though it never existed. He casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more. Okay? So that, right there, that's where we exist in redemption and salvation. Jesus has become sin. He has taken our sin away from us. And not just taken that away... He has given us something brand new, something we have never been before, a new creation that is the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay? So now here's the problem. Here's the false gospel that I so often hear from people, and I don't even think we realize we're teaching it. I don't think we even realize we espouse this view. Okay? Because somewhere along the way, we receive this gift, and we are so grateful for the gift. But somewhere along the way, the picture kind of gets twisted a little bit. And we understand we did nothing to earn this gift. We could do nothing to earn this gift. We could do nothing to be acceptable to God in and of ourselves. But once we receive this gift, it's as though we have to make monthly payments or daily payments on it. And all of a sudden, it's like those, those things that say, get a free such and such when you buy so and so. If it were free, why do I have to buy it? Mm -hmm. You see, it's not free. You're just taking all the cost of both items and applying them to one. Okay? And then we have this idea, oh good, he gave this to me. How, how much do I owe you today? How much do I have to pay today? And then we take on ourselves the burden of being sinless. We don't understand that all of our sin has been taken care of at the cross. Because see, otherwise, he'd have to keep going back up to the cross over and over and over and over again. You see that? I want to share, I was going to do an illustration this morning. I was going to bring some props up, and I couldn't quite figure out a good way to do it. So you're just going to have to use your imagination, all right? All right, everybody kick in your imagination. I know you younger people have no problem with this. I know you older people got to work at it a little bit, all right? I want you to picture your life as a clear base, okay? This is your life, clear base. And it is filled to the top and even overflowing with water. And that water is the sin in your life. Okay. Now when we come to God, all of that sin is taken care of. But in our life, we still struggle with sin, right? Right? I mean, uh, we came to the cross, I came to the cross, there were certain sins that God just, just oh, oh, gone. And I went, I don't even struggle with that anymore. That's not an issue. There were other sins that didn't just go. And sometimes, because of the righteousness that he's given me, I've been made even more aware of them. All too often as Christians, we take our life 
and we spend all of our time taking a strainer and trying to scoop out all the water out of our life that we might be pleasing unto God, right? And we scoop it in and we lift it up and it runs right back out and we throw off about three drops. And then we go back and we go, ah, oh, the sin is still here. And we get frustrated. Well, maybe just me. Okay? But I get frustrated. And it's like, God, I'm trying to get the sin out of my life. And it's not working. It's still here. Is it my job to get the sin out of my life? Well, if it were, then why do I need the cross? Couldn't I just take my faulty spoon and do it on my own? No, what is my job? My job is to pursue the righteousness of God in Christ, right? To build a relationship with Him that I didn't have before, right? Now, how many of you have had a friend or a person in your life that has been there so long that you guys can look at each other and know exactly what the other person is thinking? Or you can say the first part of a sentence and they can finish it for you exactly how you would think they were going to do it. I do. Christy talks for me all the time. <laughs> because I, a lot of times I don't, I don't talk very well. Um, I, I stutter. I can't think of words. My favorite word is thing. I, I'll, talk, I'll tell Christy, you know the thing that we were going to do? The, the thing? And she'll be like, no. Well, the, the one, after we finished that thing, we were going to do this thing. And I, I need you to remember to bring the thing so we can do it. And she smiles and nods and goes and gets the thing that I can't remember the name of so that we can finish the other thing. Not the first thing, the second thing. Okay? And she's very patient with me because a lot of times my brain is working over here, doing things over here, and I'm trying to remember something I'm supposed to do over here. And, and she'll come up and she'll say, sweetie, what about this? I don't know. <laughs> Was it okay if we do this? What do you think? <laughs> okay? But the idea is that we have been together so long that there are times where we don't need to talk at all. Okay? She can give me a look. I can give her a look and we know exactly what's going on. Now, coming back to my illustration, your base, all right? Now, let's just say that you were to have a pile of soil. And you were to take your faulty spoon and you were to scoop some of that soil up and dump it into the base of your life. What would happen to the water? Yeah, it would turn muddy, but what would happen to it? Because, see, as you put more and more soil in, what happens to the water? That's right. As you bring more of God's righteousness into your life, as you spend more time with him, becoming more like him, allowing his spirit to work in you and change you and develop in you the fruit of the spirit, the Christ-like nature, it can't help but displace the sin. Okay? So when we spend all our time trying to spoon the sin out, God is really asking us to spoon him in. He takes care of the sin. And see, we've got this false gospel that somehow he has given us this gift, but we have to pay for it by maintaining our own righteousness. Galatians chapter 5 says it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Do not become burdened again with the yoke of slavery. Well, what is Paul talking about? He's talking about adherence to the law. Somehow or another, thinking that you can do something to impress God, to merit his favor. See, that's, that's totally contrary to grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You get something you did not deserve. All right. Homework. I have homework for you. Listen to me. We have to understand this idea. We could do nothing to merit salvation. 
Mm. We can do nothing to maintain salvation. Okay? It is not our responsibility to act good enough to please God. Now, don't get me wrong. When we come to Him, we are a new creation. If we have died to sin, what do we have to do with sin? You don't just get to run out and act however you want. If you do that, you did not receive salvation in the first place. I don't know what you got. But it wasn't salvation, because if you're a new creation, you have done with that. We've put that off. Start putting God into your life. Let him push the sin out. Okay? Let him push the sin out. This is the gospel of Christ. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay? 